So let me start. So let's repeat a little bit. Um, first, a little addition to uh, symplectic linear algebra. So given a symplectic vector space, V, we say a subspace, linear subspace. E is Uh, or maybe repeat first the symplectic perpendicular space this is the set of all V and V such that omega uh, on VW vanishes for all W and E and then we say E is isotropic if E is contained in its symplectic perpendicular it's co-isotropic if the symplectic perpendicular is contained in E and it's Lagrangian if E equals the perpendicular. So clearly the uh, perpendicular space is always co-dimensional to the space E. So if E is contained in the perpendicular space, so let's say dimension of V is 2n, then that means dimension of E is at most m co-isotropic dimension of E is at least n and this means dimension of E is precisely n. Yeah, so example, uh, if we have a symplectic basis E1 to En, F1 to Fn, then span of E1 to Ek is isotropic. Uh, the span of E1 to En, F1 to Fk is uh, co-isotropic. And the span of E1 to En is Lagrangian. Yeah? Because um, the symplectic perpendicular to the span of E1 to Ek contains all the F1 to uh, 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 Fn and precisely E1 to e Ek uh, again. Yeah, the, uh, sorry, no, this is nonsense. Ah. Uh, the symplectic perpendicular contains E1 to Ek plus um, uh, 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 plus Fk plus 1 plus uh, up to Fn. Yeah, so. Um, so it's contained in there, and uh, the, the symplectic perpendicular of, uh, of this co-isotropic space, everything uh, which is symplectically perpendicular to all this is uh, precisely um, uh, Ek plus 1 up to En, the span of that.
yeah? because the omega pairing with all the f's then vanishes and uh, with un with within the e's as well. Okay, so exercise. Exercise uh, given uh, En subspace of V to N a Lagrangian subspace with some basis E1 to En. Yeah, so if we turn this around and we first give ourselves a Lagrangian subvector space, we take an arbitrary basis of that, um, then um, we can extend this to a, uh, a symplectic basis. And one more. Um, if we take the Lagrangian Grassmannian, which means the uh, space of all Lagrangian subvector spaces of, a, of R to N. This is uh, diffeomorphic, yeah, or equivalent, yeah, isomorphic, to the homogeneous space UN, yeah, the group of unitary matrices modulo ON. Yeah, so if we represent unitary matrices by complex n by n matrices, then those unitary matrices which have only real coefficients, this gives exactly O n. So this is a subgroup. Yeah, so if you take the uh, quotient, which is not a uh, not a group anymore, um, then I claim this this is a possible representation of the Lagrange and Grassmannian. Yeah, and the idea is that, um, re remember that the unitary transformations is a subgroup of the symplectic transformations, and um, it's, it's those symplectic transformations which are in particular complex linear. Yeah. And, um, to show that this is the Lagrange and Grassmannian uses the first step here. Yeah. Um, first, you show that the unitary uh, uh, space operates on the Lagrange and Grassmannians, and then you you always use Gram-Schmidt. If you have any basis, then you can turn it into a um, um, orthogonal basis by the Gram-Schmidt process. Yeah. And so. Uh, uh, and given a Lagrangian n, -dim yeah, n dimensional Lagrangian subspace, O n uh, is the stabilizer of that Lagrangian subspace. So this is why we have this quotient here. Okay, so this is uh, an addition to, to the linear situation. And then yesterday we have seen uh, the following. So uh, when we do analysis on manifolds, we have the space of vector fields. On the space of vector fields, we have this uh, Lie bracket, which turns the uh, infinite dimensional vector space of vector fields into an infinite dimensional Lie algebra. And um, if we have a symplectic structure on the manifold, then we can consider subspaces of vector fields. First, those vector fields um, whose generated flow leaves the symplectic structure invariant, which is equivalent to those vector fields which are omega dual to closed one forms. And in particular, if they are omega dual to exact one forms, we call them Hamiltonian vector fields. So, uh, and we, we saw yesterday that the Lie bracket 
apply to two Hamiltonian vector fields is again Hamiltonian. And there is an isomorphism of this um, to the space of functions modulo the constants because every vector field which is omega dual to an exact one form can be identified with a function and the function is unique up to a constant. And we have seen that the corresponding Lie bracket on vector fields can already be defined on, um, on pairs of functions and this was the Poisson bracket. Poisson bracket and uh, so repeat the formula. If we have two functions, then we define their Poisson bracket by taking their associated Hamiltonian vector fields and imply omega. And this is the same as um, so. Uh, this is the same as um, as. Um, uh, uh, so no, the, mi the minus sign. So this is minus df on xg, um, or the same as xf applied to g. All right. Okay. So this is correct. Okay, and, uh, and then we defined two notions. Uh, we consider now tuples of functions on our manifold, let's say k many functions, and we had uh, two different independence, uh, notions of independence. We say that these two, these k functions are called geometrically independent if their uh, common exterior power of the differentials vanishes nowhere. And that means F1 up to Fk are uh, seen as a map from M to Rk is a submersion. So therefore the pre-image of any k vector in M so is the k-fold intersection of uh, uh, k-many level surfaces for each function for the corresponding uh, um, coefficient of that vector. And that will be a co-dimension k submanifold by this, uh, by this assumption. Okay, and we call those k-many functions dynamically independent if for all ij we have that their pairwise Poisson bracket vanishes identically. Uh, so this means this means that their corresponding ve Hamiltonian vector fields have vanishing brackets, which means that they commute. We call this commutation. Why? Because this is equivalent to the fact that um, the generated flows for those vector fields commute. Actually, I think this is a little exercise. This is not entirely obvious. Okay. All right, so now um, first observation. So let F be the K tuple uh, 
uh, of those functions, um, which are dynamically and geometrically independent on a symplectic manifold M. Uh, let C be any vector in RK. Then the level surface, uh, so the joint level surface N being the pre-image of C, yeah, which is the intersection of, you can write it like this, intersection J equals one to K of FJ inverse CJ, where CJ is the jth uh, coordinate of C. So I'm just writing this so to realize that this is a k-fold intersection of hypersurfaces. Then this set um, is a co-isotropic submanifold. Now the fact that it's a submanifold I already explained. This comes purely from the geometric independence. That's the classical implicit function theorem. So we have to show the co-isotropic property. So we have to show that um, the tangent space at some point x of n contains its symplectic uh, perpendicular. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, Okay, so first of all, we know from implicit function theorem that the tangent space of N is the intersection of the kernels of each differential, um, I equals one to K at x. So I claim that if I take the Hamiltonian vector fields of those k-many functions at the point x, then their span is contained in the tangent space. Why that? Well, if the tangent space is the intersection of all those kernels, I just have to take the ith differential for any i and apply it to any of these vector fields. And this is by definition uh, xfj um, xfj at x um, Oh, xfj, let's put it like that, xfj applied to the function fi at x, which by definition is the Poisson bracket fj with fi and that evaluated at x, and by assumption this vanishes. So therefore we have this kernel property. Now, now, now I want to show this uh, this property. Suppose I have um, I have a tangent vector to our manifold M, which is symplectically perpendicular um, to all, to anything which is tangent to N. So this means omega at X apply to VW vanishes for all tangent vectors to N. In particular, in particular, if I apply it to one of these K um, 
Hamiltonian vector fields, uh, f, i, x, and w, this vanishes. But by definition of the Hamiltonian vector field, this is minus the difference, so this is just the convention minus, minus the differential of i at x applied to w. Yeah, so if w is symplectically perpendicular to any of these Hamiltonian vector fields, w has to be in the kernel of all those differentials. So if this is true for all i from 1 to k, it follows w has to be in the tangent space of n. So if w is perpendicular to the tangent space, it is in the tangent space. So this is exactly the co-isotropic property. Okay. So consequence Consequence, if we have this dynamic and geometric independence, K can at most be N. Yeah. So the smallest, the smallest possible dimension for a co-isotropic subspace is N. Yeah, and if it, uh, if it reaches this smallest possible dimension, then it is automatically identical to itself, uh, to its, uh, to its uh, perpendicular, and then it's Lagrangian. And, and if k equals n, then n is a Lagrangian Submanifold. Okay. So um, we actually can. Okay, let's continue from here before we formulate the theorem. Now, uh, so suppose, yeah, F as before. Yeah, so suppose we have this situation with, in fact, n many pairwise commuting functions and geometrically independent. So suppose we have this Lagrangian submanifold, and suppose n is compact and connected. Then I claim then N has to be uh, diffeomorphic diffeomorphic to the standard torus. So why is that true? So that is uh, not at all obvious, and this is a pretty strong statement. Yeah, so it's really the statement that if, if you have n many functions which are independent in the geometric sense and pairwise commuting, then a joint level set of all those functions, which is then of, of dimension n, um, has to be uh, in the compact case has to be a torus. So clearly so turn this around for a moment in your mind. So suppose you have uh, any n-dimensional submanifold of R to n. 
which is, let's say, not a torus and a compact submanifold. For example, take the n-dimensional sphere embedded in R2n. Um, clearly, it has a tubular neighborhood. Using a tubular neighborhood means the n-many perpendicular directions from this tubular neighborhood you can take as functions on an open neighborhood of this submanifold, such that the level set of those n many functions, um, the joint level set for, let's say, value zero, is the submanifold itself. So this means if you just, oops, um, if you just assume the uh, assumption of geometric independence, you can practically realize any submanifold which is embeddable in R to n as such a level set n. So the fact that here we get the rigidity to be the torus has to do something with the dynamic independence. This is exactly what forces the manifold globally to be a torus. So this is the property I'm going to use now. So I really recommend this exercise. Um, one way to see this fairly quickly is to use a different definition of this uh, Poisson bracket, of this Lie bracket. This Lie bracket can also be seen to be the so-called Lie derivative of the vector field xj by xi. So Lie derivative is always the same definition. You take the flow generated by this vector field, which is a one parameter family of diffeomorphisms, then you use these diffeomorphisms to, um, to transform the given object here. So, you t yeah, so it's the push forward of xj by the diffeomorphisms. And then this push forward still depends on the flow variable t, and you derive it by the flow variable t at t equals 0. So it's the infinitesimal transformation of this vector field by that vector field. And by this, you can see that um, uh, f uh, what, you, what you have to show is that if you, yeah, if you compose with f s x, oops, this must be an i, um, sorry. Yeah, if you compose with f, uh, with phi s x i inverse from the right, then this vector field is invariant. So if you derive, yeah, if you, if you compose it with, yeah, so if you conjugate this flow with the other flow and you derive it by s, uh, then you get the Lie bracket. Yeah? This is what you have to show. So, so for the converse, if the Lie bracket vanish, then you get this commutativity. Okay, so now we're using this commutativity. So we have the fact, we have these n many functions which are dynamically pairwise commuting. So this means Exactly this statement. I don't have to repeat this. So let so moreover, uh, n being compact follows each flow um, uh, is defined on n for all s in R. Yeah. Also, we use the fact uh, n is invariant under each flow yeah? because n is the joint level set. It's particular. N is in particular. Uh, sorry, this has to be f i. N is contained in a level set of f i. Yeah, and the entire level set of f i is invariant. Yeah, and um, so. N is contained in, in each level set, in particular in, in the entire intersection of these level sets. So, yeah, so therefore, N is invariant under all those flows. 
So it's invariant under the flows, and each flow, because n is compact, is defined for all time r. So this means uh, for any p in n, we can define the map phi p from rn to n by saying I take n many different time variables, s1 to sn, and taking, um, I take the flow of the first function with the time variable s1, the flow for the second function with the time variable s2, up to the flow for the last function with the time variable Sn, and apply this to P. So we observe that this does not depend on the order of um, these n many variables. So you can, because these flows all commute, you can swap them in, in any order you like. So that means, uh, that means, so uh, we also can compute if we take the differential. So first of all, this is well defined. And I, if I uh, derive this, in any of these directions. Yeah, so I, I want to derive it by any of these variables. Yeah, this is nothing else than the derivative by the ith variable of, and now I'm commuting, so I'm taking the, I'm bringing the ith a component in front because it commutes. Yeah, and then here there is the one guy missing, and then up to Sn, X, Fn. So if I commute this and I have the, uh, the flow um, by which, by whose time variable I want to derive uh, on the left, then this is nothing else than the very same vector field. So it's the vector field x, f, i at the point uh, phi p of s1 to sn. So, so this means this is, first of all, it's a differentiable map. And its derivative by the ith variable gives us the ith Hamiltonian vector field, which by, by assumption is non-zero. So um, first of all, it's non-zero, and um, and they span what we have or we have already seen this before. They Yeah, they span the tangent space, so they are linear independent. So this means phi p is a local diffeomorphism. So, um, so in particular, uh, okay. So this map is a local diffeomorphism. This is the first statement. Then uh, consider um, consider gamma to be the set of um, uh, vectors uh, little gamma in Rn such that uh, phi p applied to gamma equals p. 
So clearly, uh, zero is contained in gamma. And because phi p is a local diffeomorphism, each element of gamma yeah, uh, is, uh, is isolated in Rn. So gamma is a discrete subset of Rn, but it's not only a subset of Rn. Ah, oh, I forgot something. Ah. Okay, it's a discrete subset. So I forgot to say something very important. Uh, phi p is a um, uh, no, uh, so phi p gives an Rn action action on on n by saying um, uh, any vector sigma sigma on so fall x in n and uh, sigma in Rn we say uh, sigma on x is defined to be um, uh, phi of um, uh, uh, um, phi of uh, uh, okay x here applied to sigma, right? Because of the flow property. Yeah, if uh, yeah, if I add if I add any uh, any constant to the ith time, that's the same as composing another uh, uh, yeah another time with with this variable the flow. Yeah, so the so the uh, um, the semigroup property uh, of the flows gives us that we have an Rn action. So that Rn action property tells us that gamma is uh, nothing else than the stabilizer of the concrete chosen point P. So this means gamma is a discrete subgroup of Rn. So in fact, and, and it is abelian, again, by this commuting property. So follows, it's a lattice. Yeah? That means it's isomorphic to, to Zn. Yeah? So we find n many vectors in Rn linearly independent such that Gamma is the integral span of these vectors, and that gives this uh, group isomorphism to Zn. Yeah. So therefore, what we have is um, so we have a well-defined, well-defined map. Uh, phi p, let's say, hat from Rn modulo Zn uh, to n, namely uh, phi p hat on uh, um, on S1 up to Sn is uh, defined as phi p of um, well let's put it yeah uh, uh, phi p of um, s1 times gamma 1 plus oh, let's let's use sn that's a little bit misleading let's call these variables x x1 to xn, 
yeah, because um, using these basis vector gamma 1 to gamma n, yeah, I'm, I'm actually doing a linear coordinate change on Rn. Yeah, so these xn's are not the same as the sn's. The sn's play the role of the canonical Cartesian coordinates on Rn. Whereas these x, x1 to xn are new coordinates on Rn, yeah, so it's a different Rn. Yeah, and I'm I'm and I'm taking the gamma gamma 1 to gamma n as a um, Basis, yeah. So this is a full n vector, and if I take the n many coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, Euclidean Cartesian coordinates of this n vector, then these are the s1 to sn. Okay, and the way I defined it, um, I see that this is a bijection, and since um, phi p is a local diffeomorphism, this whole thing is a diffeomorphism. So we see n is diffeomorphic to the standard torus. Okay. Um, so now the uh, important statement is that uh, not only so let's repeat what, what we have been doing. We assume that we have a maximal system of dynamically and geometrically independent functions on our symplectic manifold. Maximal in the sense that we can at most have n many of those. And uh, if we take a joint level set, a pre-image of a vector, if we take such a yeah, n-dimensional submanifold n, and if we assume that it is compact, then it has to be a torus. Actually, what happens if n is not compact? Well, if n is not compact, we have yeah, most of these statements work. Yeah, we only have to be careful that um, we only have to be careful that the flows are well defined. So in general, we, we, we need to assume, we, we have to guarantee some condition that the flows are defined for all variables as i to be an r. If that happens, yeah, if we have, a, have another condition which guarantees that this is all defined, then well, what, what, can, uh, what can happen um, if n is not compact, um, Essentially, the, the typical situation which we have is that we have finitely many directions in which we have some kind of compactness. So, yeah, so the usual thing which we want, which we will expect is we have some directions in which we have compactness where they are wrapping up, yeah? So it's not a lattice of, uh, of full rank, it's just a small sub-lattice, yeah? Um, yeah? We still have an Rn action on the level set and we just have to see in how many independent directions we have actually this wrapping up. So in general, we should expect that the level set, if it's not fully compact, it's not a torus, then maybe it's some sort of k-dimensional cylinder. Um, uh, yeah, filling some non-compact region of the given symplectic submanifold. Hmm? Here. Sorry. Gamma, why is gamma of rank n? Why gamma r? Why why is gamma of rank n? Because uh, phi p is a local local diffeomorphism. Um, that is a good question. I mean, you have to work a little bit. Um, if right, uh, if if you have more, if if you need more vectors to span gamma, 
then gamma cannot be discrete in Rn. Yeah, they, they, they have to have accumulation points. Yeah, so if you have, okay, so take, take a generating set of gamma, yeah, so that they, they generate everything. Yeah, so, so take those vectors. Um, those vectors might turn out to be linearly independent over Z, but they are certainly not linearly independent over R because the entire space Rn is n-dimensional. No, I mean, if gamma has a less rank. Because, ah, because of compactness. By, um, yeah, that's right. Uh, we, uh, our assumption in the very beginning was N is compact and connected. Yeah, connected means that uh, clearly, Clearly, this map, because Rn is connected, we can only reach a connected component of N. And um, by, uh, by compactness, the map has to be on two. And if we, um, if, uh, um, right, yeah, if, if gamma has uh, has smaller rank than n, yeah, then uh, I mean, what what we if we divide by gamma, yeah, Rn modulo gamma turns phi p into an injective map. Yeah, so that means we be, we we reach a bijection. It's onto and modulo gamma. It's injective. So if n is compact uh, and gamma doesn't have the full rank n, then it will be torus, yeah, a smaller dimensional torus cross uh, cross Rn. So it yeah, so it's not compact. So yeah, by the assumption of compactness of n, we must have a rank n. So there, 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 I mean, this is a good question. There are a couple of, uh, couple of questions you have to answer before you see that it's actually a lattice of rank n. Yeah, it's the discreteness, uh, so the local diffeomorphism property and the assumption of compactness. Okay. So um, right. So uh, now I want to go a step further. Um, let me formulate the theorem now. So let's first give this whole thing a name. We say let mn, oh, m2n omega be symplectic manifold. Suppose we have n many functions on this manifold which are geometrically and dynamically independent, then this situation, manifold functions, symplectic structure, is called a is called a completely integrable system. Yeah, call it CIS. Okay. Theorem by Arnold, Res Joost, and Liouville. It says the following Let this completely uh, integral system be given and assume that. 
the level set of zero, yeah, without loss of generality, we take the pre-image of zero. Uh, if you'd like to take any other value, then you simply add some constant to those functions. Adding constant to the functions doesn't change anything, yeah, because they're still pairwise commuting. Um, so we assume that it's non-empty, and again, we assume it's compact and connected. Uh, then we have the following statement. First, what we have already shown, n itself is a Lagrangian submanifold diffeomorphic to the n torus. So it's an embedded Lagrangian torus. And secondly, now it looks a little bit technical, the statement will be um, we find a whole tubular neighborhood of this one torus which is foliated by tori. And each of these leaves is itself an invariant uh, Lagrangian torus. So I will formulate this. So we find uh, neighborhoods of zero in Rn, neighborhoods, and a tubular neighborhood U of N within M. And diffeomorphisms first mu from uh, D2 uh, onto D1, fixing the origin. Yeah, so it's a sort of uh, n-dimensional coordinate transformation uh, uh, in Rn. And now the most important thing is this uh, Tula neighborhood map Psi. So the tubular neighborhood of U becomes then um, diffeomorphic to the product Tn cross disk, for example, on U. And U can be foliated in, so it's the set, it's a disjoint union yeah, over all values in or all vectors in D2. We take the pre-image of C and take that part which lies in U. If you ask why am I not just writing pre-image of C, well, it, uh, it, could be, um, it could be that far away somewhere we might, for other values of C, yeah, we might have other connected components. And uh, just to be on the safe side, yeah, we take this. Uh, we take the part which is caught by the neighborhood U. Uh, such that. So first, psi becomes a symplectic diffeomorphism. Uh, so by convenience, I'm changing here. Uh, um, I'm changing the standard symplectic structure to become dyi wedge dxi. So previously or earlier, I introduced the standard structure as dxi wedge dyi. I have summing up i equals one to m. Now I'm swapping for the negative. This is simply. Uh, for convenience, you uh, so that, yeah, and this is the point. Um, I want the x uh, variable to be the toric variable, the compact variable, identified with the n-dimensional time flow, which we had before. And I want the y variable to be identified With the, essentially with the value of f. However, and this is the point, we need an n-dimensional um, coordinate change uh, 
in, in this direction of the, um, uh, of the n-many functions. Uh, I will explain that uh, in a moment. So in particular, in particular, we have that the torus Uh, where the d1 coordinate is the origin, yeah. So for y equals zero, um, the standard torus is is mapped onto n, which is the preimage of zero, and for any other y. The torus is uh, mapped onto the onto the uh, uh, piece in the level set uh, for a value c within the neighborhood u, where y is given by mu of c. Okay, so that means. The one torus which, or so, which uh, so the one given level set n which we have identified to be a torus happens to be uh, surrounded by a whole neighborhood foliated by neighbor uh, tori. So uh, you can sort of take the following picture. Um, so we have sort of yeah. So we have this sort of foliated uh, set of tori, and um, yeah. So the, the usual situation is usually we cannot expect on a given symplectic manifold those functions to be everywhere geometrically independent. Yeah? Somewhere we will have critical values. So for example, um, so this, this picture suggestively looks like the, yeah, that that this Torah, anyway, this is the wrong picture. This is a picture in dimension three, and we should rather have something in dimension four, yeah, which I cannot draw. Yeah, it looks like this Torah is shrinking to become sort of a degenerate torus. But then in the middle here, of course, then uh, we would have a, a singular points for those functions f. So in any case, um, this is anyway just a local statement for a, a sufficient neighborhood of the given uh, set n. So this is the first statement. And now we have the fo following uh, corollary. Corollary. Now suppose that we have a particular function which we which we uh, use as a Hamiltonian, such that this Hamiltonian commutes commutes with all the given uh, functions f. Now clearly, uh, since it's commuting with all these fi's, um, h cannot be geometrically independent from f1 to fn. Yeah, so it means it's sort of, h is sort of generated by those functions, or what we usually do yeah, in concrete problems, h is one of them. Yeah, but we single out one function to be the Hamiltonian because we are a priori interested in understanding the dynamics of that very Hamiltonian. Suppose we have this, then this theorem tells us that uh, if we have this particular set n, um, we find 
a function h purely depending on n many variables such that the Hamiltonian in these coordinates, yeah, in this uh, symplectic um, uh, tubular neighborhood of the torus, in these coordinates, the function h only depends on the y variables. Um, and consequently, uh, yeah, so this, this comes from the fact that h is dynamically independent from all those functions. Yeah, the flow of the of the ith function generates, uh, uh, um, or the the, ve the Hamiltonian vector field of the ith function, yeah, is is the flow yeah, gives the flow in the xi variable. So those functions they correspond to the xi coordinates, and the fact that this commutes means that h cannot depend explicitly on these x coordinates, yeah, which which give the flow in the i direction, in the fi direction. So this is exactly the statement. So now using the fact that psi is a symplectic diffeomorphism, it 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 gives an um, isomorphism of dynamical systems. So if we write down the Hamilton equation for little h and the Hamilton equation for capital H, then they are they are they are isomorphically mapped to each other by psi. So this means um, in the x and y coordinates, the dynamical system for H simply looks like x dot equals dH by dy uh, uh, at y0 and y dot is 0 yeah, because it's constant. And this is the reason, this is the only reason why I've chosen this symplectic form because by our convention, if I want the Hamilton equation to look like this with a minus sign here, uh, y dot being dh by dx, which happens to be zero, yeah, um, I, need, I need this sign convention. So this means, so this means the uh, the Hamilton system, the Hamiltonian system on N is isomorphic, isomorphic to the map X and Y is mapped to X plus T, um, T times uh, W and uh, and uh, y uh, uh, and y, uh, y is constant. Where w is dh by dy at y, uh, and this is a vector. This is a vector in R n. So in other terms, we have here uh, an n-dimensional harmonic yeah, harmonic oscillator. Yeah, essentially H uh, 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 on uh, well, this is this is not entirely true. Locally it looks like harmonic oscillator. Yeah? So we have a quasi Quasi periodic, quasi periodic motion. Yeah, because uh, now it depends on these frequencies omega, omega one to omega n. These these n many coordinates, whether orbits on n uh, close up or densely fill the torus. They close up for for some points. Um, uh, when we have at least two frequencies which are rationally dependent, and if they are all rationally independent, then uh, each orbit fills the whole torus uh, densely. Okay, so harmonic oscillator is not completely true because so far we are just considering this one level set N. Harmonic oscillator, the full, the general harmonic oscillator 
would be uh, h of y is um, uh, sum i equals 1 to n, 1 half uh, omega i uh, y squared. Yeah. So this would mean um, this is a special case yeah, of a Hamiltonian system, of a completely integrable system. Yeah, and um, fi could be, for example, sorry, y squared, i squared here, would be the ith summand of this uh, of this Hamiltonian. Yeah, and clearly they are all um, uh, pairwise commuting, and um, apart from the subset where one of these y coordinates zero, this is the singular situation which you have to take out. Everywhere else, they are geometrically independent. Yeah, the differentials vanish, uh, vanish nowhere, and they're linear independent. Yeah, and uh, and because um, in the y variables they're quadratic, the differential uh, is. Um, uh, gives everywhere the same frequency. So, wait a moment. Uh, um, I, I, D, H. No, it's true. Yeah. It, Area give, gives the same the, the, the same frequency exactly, yeah. And um, so, in in general, of course, um, this Hamiltonian will not be quadratic in Y. So, but it also will have higher order terms. And this higher order terms, if we have cubic terms and higher for our Hamiltonian in the Y direction, this will mean that. Uh, uh, on each on, on each different torus which we have in this completely integrable situation, we have a different set of frequencies, and the frequencies will change with the y vector. Okay, so there's a, a so definition: the coordinates x and y in uh, T n and uh, D one are called. angular momentum coordinates. Yeah, and um, so the statement is if we do have a completely integrable system, then, uh, and if we can assume compactness, then locally near such an invariant torus, we have a whole family of tori, and we can find these angular momentum coordinates. So this is one. So this was the uh, prime goal of uh, for, for physics, for classical mechanics, for a very very long period. Yeah. So in celestial mechanics, when um, when you try to understand the n-body problem of celestial mechanics, then sort of historically you have a sort of Taylor series expansion. It's like Kepler was the first to realize that um, in, uh, in first approximation the planets are moving on, um, on ellipses with the sun in one of the focal points. So actually, if you have the two-body problem, two-body problem in R3, so R3, the configuration space, so being, yeah, so that means uh, uh, each mass, um, so this means we have for, for two, two mass points, we have R6, and we have at first a 12-dimensional phase space. However, there are lots of symmetries. And um, in the two-body problem, yeah, so the Hamiltonian is the kinetic energy plus the potential, which only sees the, um, the, uh, the uh, attraction by the two mass points, yeah, the, by the Coulomb potential. So if you, 
if you if you, now you try to find a lot of symmetries yeah, which you can divide out. So the first symmetry clearly is you you move things into the center of gravity. Yeah? So you, you use the translation invariance. Um, and then the next symmetry is that it's, uh, it's um, invariant under uh, rotation, yeah? under the uh, um, SO3 operation. Yeah? And so you have invariance of angular momentum. Then you have the invariance of the energy and so on. And um, so what we're looking for is if you have the Hamiltonian, you try to find um, sufficiently many invariant observables which are pairwise independent. Yeah? So they're not produced by the observables before, uh, which means geometric independence and the fact that they are they, they should be invariant under H, so they the Poisson commute with H, and they have to pairwise Poisson commute. And um, in fact, the two-body problem is a completely integrable system, um, which is not entirely obvious because the translation invariance gives um, reduces by three dimensions. A priori, we were in a 12 dimensional space. Yeah? The translation invariance re, re, uh, um, uh, reduces um, by um, actually by six dimensions because in the uh, configuration space you, you fix the center and then in the total momentum you reduce it to zero. Then the, the angular momentum as only one vector reduces to a four-dimensional space, essentially you want to reduce it down so that it becomes a two-dimensional, so uh, uh, only a system in, in, in a two-dimensional phase space. So there's, there's, one, um, there's one, uh, in part, one particular symmetry which was not obvious, which was found um, implicitly by um, uh, yeah, by the different mathematicians uh, throughout the centuries, and later on, was called um, the um, the uh, the lens vector. So that it turns out in the end um, that you can you can bring it down exactly to this ellipsis. Yeah, so you can kill as many uh, um, invariants such that in the end. It, it comes down exactly to this ellipsis. So, so Kepler's, Kepler's observation is in a way the true solution of the n-body problem provided that each planet only sees the attraction force by the sun. Yeah, it's like you only have each planet with the sun and the planets among each other, they have no attractive force. If you do this, then it simply means you have n many two-body problems, independent two-body problems, and that would be a completely integrable system. So the, the big question is, what happens if you take Kepler's uh, celestial mechanics, yeah, if the n-body problem, and you start switching on the, the planetary uh, interaction? Yeah, the Jupiter is having an effect on Mars and vice versa and with Saturn and so on. Um, so since the attraction of planets among each other is much smaller than the attraction with, this, with the Sun, you can think of a small perturbation of the, um, of the uh, uh, Keplerian problem, which is a completely integrable system. And um, so that question was for a very long time open and already for the three-body problem, already saying sun and two planets, altogether three-body, it was completely unclear uh, what would happen with this perturbation of the Keplerian problem uh, until essentially the end of the 19th century. There was um, a prize set out by the King of Norway in 1880s sometime, 1882 or something, to figure out whether um, or whether the three-body problem is stable 
or eventually will uh, 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 become unstable and one of the uh, th three points, uh, three masses might be kicked out of the system. And it was, as, as it was uh, Poincaré who showed actually that um, the three-body problem is not solvable, it's not completely integrable, yeah? because he was able to show the instability. Okay, uh, so this is what we're going to see next week. Um, and now for the remaining time, uh, I would like to explain a little bit the proof of the theorem. I'm definitely not going to give you a full proof of this theorem. Okay, the, so the first step in the proof, so it goes through several steps. The first step is to show that N itself is a torus. This is what, what I've already explained before I wrote down the theorem. So the next step is once we have one torus, so here's, here's the picture of the torus. Yeah? So this is N and we have one point. This was the point P and if we apply these N many flows to the point P, yeah, we move on this one torus. Yeah? So now what we want to do is we want to provide a tubular neighborhood. So the idea will be we um, provide symplectic coordinates, two n-dimensional symplectic coordinates around this point P in a way that half of them and many of those symplectic coordinates are exactly identifiable with these uh, uh, flow coordinates, yeah, this x1 to xn on, uh, on the torus, and the other n-many coordinates are in the transversal direction. So this is the second step. So, okay, let's say first step, first step of proof, so proof, first step is n is a torus, yeah, which we have already done. And the second step, second step is, um, it's the so-called theorem of Liouville. So this is the Liouville contribution, the torus is the Arnold contribution. And Recios was the guy who filled out, he filled out all the gaps and, uh, 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 which, which were left open by Arnold. Arnold. Um, Given those n many functions, um, oh, and any point, let's say P and M, um, yeah, so zero, zero was the common value at this point P, um, there exists a neighborhood. V of P in M, so open neighborhood in M, not only within the torus, but in the two n-dimensional manifold, and functions G1 to Gn in this, uh, uh, in this neighborhood, each of them real valued, such that also, these functions are um, pairwise commuting, so dynamically independent, and we have the Poisson bracket of Gi with Fj is delta Ij, and um, each of this function takes the value zero on the point P, and the entire set of functions F1 to Fn, and then G1 to Gn uh, vanishes nowhere on V. So consequence, the consequence is if I take the whole set of functions, first the g's and then the f's 
This is a map from uh, V to R to N. By this statement, um, that the total, that the entire uh, uh, exterior power vanishes nowhere, that means that I have two n many linearly independent differentials. That means this is a diffeomorphism, um, at least locally near zero. Yeah. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, on some neighborhood of zero in. R to N, and these statements on the Poisson brackets tell us that the pullback of uh, omega zero uh, is omega. So this means uh, this is a um, nonlinear way uh, of providing symplectic coordinates. Essentially, it's a different version, yeah, or it's a it's almost the same as the Darboux theorem, except that, so it's sort of a stronger Darboux theorem. It, yeah, Darboux theorem tells us, given a point, we find a local neighborhood uh, with some symplectic coordinates. Now it says that we can find those symplectic coordinates such that they complete uh, uh, a set of half coordinates. Yeah? We have half of the coordinates already, and we can complete them to become symplectic coordinates. This is what this theorem says. Okay, and then in this statement up there, psi is simply, simply the inverse of this. Yeah, because the way we took them now means f composed psi at x, y, yeah? So x, y are now the values of, so the x are the values of the uh, um, g coordinates and y are the values of the f coordinates. Yeah? So therefore this becomes y. So note that, note that we have if we, uh, if we take these coordinates psi and we apply the flow. Yeah, so first of so that, so this is now this local neighborhood where we have with this chi inverse, yeah, these local psi coordinates. And we have, and by this theorem of Liouville, we have found them such that in the uh, x, respectively g direction, or the, the g direction coincides with the x, x direction. So that was the whole task. So that this is exactly the statement that um, uh, if I go in the x direction, this is this is identified with s. So this means. Um, the flow in the s direction corresponds to a shift in the x direction. Why is that? This is exactly what I wrote down as corollary before. Because the derivative in the s direction means uh, it, it gives me the Hamiltonian vector field of the function fi. Yeah? But the Hamiltonian vector field of the function fi under those symplectic coordinates is turned into um, uh, um, a uh, Hamiltonian vector field corresponding to the ith coordinate y. Um, so because y is linear, um, that vector field just gives the, uh, uh, the translation, yeah, the linear translation in the ith direction. Okay, and this is exactly the identity which tells me, which gives me the compatibility of the x coordinates on the torus with the x coordinates in the neighborhood. And of course, what I'm doing now is I'm now using the flow on n to move these neighborhoods along the torus. Yeah, this is the next step. So I move it with the torus, and because of this compatibility, I see that on n, it all fits together. 
Yeah, and also because um, this is just the shift, they also fit together in the in the other directions. Yeah, so they, they they all fit together to become coordinates. However, there's there's one thing which does not fit yet. So, okay, so let's write it like the following. The th so I, I, I was I was a little bit. A sloppy. So they, they perfectly fit together on N. They might not yet fit together off N. And this is what I have to uh, adjust. And I do this as follows. Now consider theta to be the map Rn cross. Uh, no, sorry. Yes. Uh, w is. Um, I take uh, <clears throat> so D uh, this was a little bit sloppy of me so D, D is um, the value of um, Uh, wait a moment. I'm taking uh, uh, <coughs> let's take D of zero is some small neighborhood of zero. So uh, I'm defining now the map as follows. So now, um, uh, in this little ball, I just take the y coordinates, and instead of writing x here within psi, I'm writing it there because by this formula I see that um, I have them twice. Either I use x here or s there. So I'm fixing zero, psi zero zero is the point p, and from that p on I'm using the flow. Yeah, so this means now this becomes again a local diffeomorphism in the full set of coordinates x, y. And uh, so this is theta of x, y. And clearly, we have uh, that f is invariant. Uh, because f is invariant under this flow, I see that f of theta x, y is uh, f at psi 0, y, and is y. So I realize I'm finished with time. So I cannot finish the proof, but I can explain what the difficulty is, which still needs to be fixed. So the problem is now, I would like to say that theta gives our uh, requested tubular neighborhood. However, so the, um, the problem which needs to be solved is, I know that um, theta, uh, of um, so x plus um, gamma at zero is theta of x zero for all gamma in this lattice which I had before. Yeah. So this was this periodicity lattice um, for the uh, for this n-dimensional flow. However. Um, if I take another value uh, y here, which is different from zero, I cannot expect theta to have the same, same periodicity in the x direction for different values of y. So what, um, what we can show is that for every value y, there is some lattice which describes the periodicity of theta. Um, However, and that means um, I, I have like 
Yeah, so it's like RN modulo uh, a lattice which depends on Y cross this uh, uh, D neighborhood uh, of zero. So this here's where the Y lives, and this is where the where the X lives, and this gives our uh, uh, neighborhood U of n. Yeah. So um, so the uh, set theoretically we can define this. Yeah. So it it becomes a bijection. However. Um, my domain uh, depends on y, which is not very good. Yeah, it's uh, uh, you can think of this as a uh, bundle over d zero, but essentially what we want is one and the same torus cross d zero uh, to um, to parameterize this. So this means we have to sort of make this independent of y. So we need a y dependent coordinate transformation in n many directions such that the entire transformation is still a symplectic coordinate transformation. And the fact, and, and, okay, and, and this can be done, yeah? so in, in the space of symplectic, of, uh, symplectic transformations, there's still enough flexibility to arrange that. Uh, and this is the last step to be filled. So I'm sketching that, uh, uh, I will explain this next week. Actually, uh, since I have to move it to next week anyway, this means I can uh, give you also the proof then of the theorem of Liouville. Yeah? So I was wondering whether I should do this, but now I'm actually doing this because it's using the same method. It's using the method of generating functions, which is a very useful technique. So that means I will be um, even more sketchy about KM theory next, next week. Okay, so we stop here. We have one more session next week. I finish the proof and I say a little bit about KM theory to conclude that our ergodicity is not a generic prop uh, property of Hamiltonian systems. And then we're done. All right, thank you. <laughs>